why were they on the side of the just you know of, of the people you know forcing discrimination and you know, trying to suppress uh, free speech? Many of the mainstream so-called Jewish organizations, organizations particularly like ADL that uh, grew up fighting anti-Semitism, have now sold themselves out to the progressive movement. It's, you know, all out war by the left on the Supreme Court. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor-in-chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Thanks for joining us. Today, we have an important conversation for you about the recent decisions handed down by the U.S. Supreme Court. But first, I want to remind you to like this video and podcast, subscribe to JNS, and click on the bell for notifications. I also want to remind you that you don't have to wait a full week for more top story analysis. There is a daily top story podcast where I share more news and analysis with you about the most significant issues we're facing today. You can find The Daily Show under Top Story with Jonathan Tobin on the JNS channel on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, I'd like to let you know that JNS is also on Telegram. You can find the latest news, including Top Story, and other JNS TV content there by subscribing. And one program. We will be taking next week off while I'm off attending the American Jewish Press Association conference, but we'll be back in two weeks. And now to today's program. It is an axiom of politics that where you stand depends on where you sit, which is to say that most people's positions on political issues are determined by their interests and affiliations. Nothing better illustrates this than the question of whether or not you support an independent judiciary or limits on the power of the courts to overturn the decisions of the executive or legislative branches of government. In Israel, the opposition to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government believed that nothing less than the future of their nation's democracy is at stake in preventing the democratically elected majority of the Knesset from enacting laws that would introduce some checks on the power of that country's Supreme Court and judicial system. To hear the anti-Netanyahu demonstrators tell it, anything that might restrict the ability of the court to override any government decision of any kind, regardless of whether the controversy is based on a legal dispute, based only on the judge's arbitrary sense of what is reasonable, is an authoritarian coup. This talking point is echoed by those in the United States who dislike Netanyahu largely for other reasons, with, for example, Vice President Kamala Harris interjecting a lecture about the importance of an independent judiciary into her otherwise anodyne speech at a ceremony honoring Israel's Independence Day as part of the Biden administration's effort to pressure Israel's government to drop the legislation. Indeed, it has become a matter of faith for American liberals, as well as Israel's own liberal elites, that the bid for judicial reform is the thin edge of the wedge of a totalitarian tide sweeping the world. But here in the United States, the political left has a very different take on the question of judicial independence. Israelis who chafe at a liberal Supreme Court majority are denounced by liberals as authoritarians. But American liberals consider the conservative majority on the U.S. Supreme Court to be the authoritarians, who must be stopped by any means possible, including court packing, dubious ethical smears, or even impeachment. They were particularly outraged by the trio of decisions handed down by the court last week during the final days of the judicial session. The court's banning of race-based affirmative action that resulted in discrimination against Asians and others was bashed as racist by those who believe that imposing quota on college, quotas on college admissions, as well as hiring practices elsewhere, is the only way that African Americans or Hispanics can get ahead. They railed at the decision that protected the free speech and artistic freedom rights of a website designer who refused to produce a creative work that offended her conscious and religious beliefs as legalizing discrimination. And they were outraged at the court striking down of President Biden's effort to cancel student loan debt 
bizarrely, they called that a case of judicial overreach, even though the truth was the opposite. It was Biden, acting without benefit of law, who had arbitrarily abrogated to himself the power to cancel the debt, effectively forcing working-class taxpayers to pay for the education of the upper classes. Now, one may agree or disagree with any of those decisions, just as one can differ on the legitimacy of any of the Israeli courts freelancing into divisive and diverse issues like the exploitations of their nation's offshore gas fields or the minutia of military decisions. But the hypocrisy of seeking to buttress Israel's courts while seeking to limit the power of American justices is lost on Biden and his corporate media cheerleaders who mimic his contradictory stands on the courts in both countries. Of course, there really is no comparison between the two courts. The U.S. Supreme Court does act as a check on the power of the legislative and executive branches, but does so in an extremely limited manner, only stepping in where, as with Biden's lawless student debt fiat, violations of constitutional order are clearly at stake. By contrast, in Israel, it is the court and judicial system that is essentially lawless, giving itself the power to exercise a veto of the democratically elected government on no basis but its own desire to ensure that the political left will continue to rule no matter who wins elections. On top of that, it wishes to continue a system of choosing justices that allows the existing liberal majority to also exercise a veto over their choice of successors, thus ensuring that the leftist majority continues in perpetuity. We know very well that were the positions reversed and Israel's court was dominated by conservatives, nationalists, or religious Jews, the demonstrators currently blocking highways, access to the airport, and besieging the homes of Knesset members and harassing them would be demanding judicial reform. And if the U.S. Supreme Court was handing down decisions that the left liked, as it did when there was a liberal majority from the 1940s to the 1970s, then they would be denouncing any criticism of the judicial system as anti-democratic and authoritarian. The problem is not just that the left is wrong when it comes to its positions on the Israeli and American courts. It's that they are so convinced of their own righteousness and the hateful nature of their political opponents that they are insensible to their hypocrisy and dishonesty. That, more than just the bad reasoning behind their stand, and the intolerance for free discourse and differences this attitude breeds is what is truly posing a threat to democracy in both countries. To discuss the recently completed Supreme Court term and the implications of its decisions, we're fortunate to have with us today one of the keenest observers of legal issues around, as well as one of our favorite guests on this podcast. William A. Jacobson is a clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School, where he has taught since 2007. In 2008, he founded the Legal Insurrection website. In 2019, he launched the Legal Insurrection Foundation, a nonprofit research and investigative group focused on promoting free speech and open dialogue, capitalism and free enterprise, and understanding the intersectional left. He also created the criticalrace.org, a website that catalogs critical race training in higher education and at elite private schools through an interactive map. William Jacobson, welcome back to Top Story. Thank you for having me back. Well, Bill, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. During a holiday week, I want to start by asking you to break down some of the key decisions that were recently handed down by the U.S. Supreme Court. Let's begin with the ruling on affirmative action. What was at stake in this case, and who were the parties involved, and you know what, what, what was really behind this case, and what is the background? Well, the legal backdrop is whether you can use race and to what extent in making decisions for admissions to universities. Of course, that has a lot of implications beyond university admissions, but that, that was the issue. And that's been a fight for many decades, going back to the 1970s, as to what extent to achieve diversity, you can take race into account and essentially in, engage in racial discrimination, favoritism. Uh, discrimination can be positive or negative, but favoritism 
to achieve diversity. And so that was the issue. The two universities at issue here were Harvard and the University of North Carolina. Harvard received all the attention, but University of North Carolina had its own case there. And the Harvard issue was particularly stark because the plaintiff there was a group, Students for Fair Admissions, but really the nature of the claim was that the people being discriminated against in these cases were Asian students, students of Asian descent. So this was really not set up as a, what some people refer to as reverse discrimination. I don't like that term, but some people use it. This was that Asian students were being discriminated against, mirroring what Harvard had done in the 1920s to limit the number of Jews by using so-called holistic approaches, soft factors, doing away with hard scores, whether it's SATs now and grades. And so that was really the issue. Could Harvard and UNC take the race of the applicant into account as far part of a broader agenda to diversify the, the incoming class? And that was the issue in, in both cases. Yeah. Um, before we break down the decision, I think it's very important to highlight the point that you just made about what was going on with Asians. Um, the facts of the case seem to be not really in dispute, or at least very conclusively proved, that Harvard, at least, did discriminate against Asians. How did that work? And how did they justify that? Well, Harvard would say they never discriminated. They would say they had a series of uh, components of their admissions process, and it just so happened to work out that they reduced the number of Asians. But the key part of that process was a personality score. Asian students regularly, based on the way Harvard did it, fared worse on those personalities. Yeah, they all had bad personalities. They weren't right, kind. That's what's so absurd about it. You know, they weren't so kind. They weren't, you know, involved. They, they just, you know, they were bad. They, it was as if Harvard was saying, we don't discriminate. We, you know, Asians are just bad people. Well, and, and that was part of the stereotyping that went on, and that was part of the ruse that went on, these soft holistic factors and that was a key component, the uh, personality test to personality scores at, at Harvard. And UNC, I don't think, had that component, but in both universities, they took race into account when making their admissions decisions. And both universities receive many more applicants than they do for each available spot. So it's very much a zero-sum game, and that, I think, factored into the court's analysis and the court, I think, used that term, that if you are going to favor one race where there are a limited number of spots, then you are, by definition, disfavoring another. And so there's always somebody on the other side of that equation. And so that, that was the issue, that they were using the same sort of factors to miraculously, like they reduced the, the percentage of Jews down to 12% for decades. Yeah. Okay, They reduced the number, the percentage of Asians. Yeah, I mean, and it, it just it was very clear that um, African, you know, African Americans, the, the groups that were favored by this process had much lower grades, you know, lowest, lower, much lower deciles of, of uh, the admission scores, whereas people with much higher grades, uh, if they were Asians or, or members of other races, just had a much lower chance of being admitted. But Tell us exactly what the decision said and, you know, what are the implications uh, of, um, of this ruling and uh, what does it mean, you know, in terms of, uh, of discrimination um, going forward? Well, there were two different cases. There were all nine justices hearing the UNC case, but not the Harvard case because the newest justice, Katanji Brown Jackson, used to be on the board of overseers of Harvard. So she were a trustee, whatever her title was. So she was essentially one of the litigants here, uh, or at least her, her oversight was. So she recused herself from the Harvard case, but not the UNC case. So we have a 6-3 decision in the uh, UNC case and a 6-2 decision in the Harvard case. Um, and so uh, 
what the court said, and it was one opinion, what the court said was that under the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, which says each, no state shall infringe the equal protection of the laws, so each person is entitled to equal protection of the law, that that prohibits discrimination and it prohibits all discrimination. It doesn't prohibit, like some of the dissenters claimed and some activists claimed, it did not prohibit only anti black discrimination, it prohibited all racial discrimination. And so that was a fault line, historical fault line in the dissents versus the majority, which is the dissents say, no, they're actually, uh, you can discriminate in favor of, under the 14th of Ameri uh, uh, Amendment, blacks, whereas the majority said, no, there's no historical uh, legitimacy to that claim. Uh, and so, and Clarence Thomas, in his concurring opinion, spent dozens of pages going over the history of the 14th Amendment. And when I say dozens, I mean literally dozens of pages. Uh, and, and so that was the major fault line. And they then went over the history of U.S. Supreme Court decisions and how in 2003, in the so-called Grutter case, the door was opened a little bit. The court found that having a diverse student body could be a compelling state interest. So in order to survive a claim or to uh, you know, maintain racial discrimination, there's a very narrow ground on which you can do it. You have to prove you have a compelling state interest and that the remedy you're opposing is narrowly tailored to meet that compelling state interest. And Grutter found that a diverse student body could be didn't say it always was, but could be considered a compelling state interest, but that the remedy had to be finite, had to be finite in time. They even talked about, well, this shouldn't exist anymore in 25 years, mm -hmm. and it had to be very narrow. It was narrow. Justice O'Connor's comment that said that she yes. couldn't imagine, you know, in 25 years, it, it can't go on forever. Yeah, and, and so basically what the court said is it didn't, throw out Grutter, it didn't say that diversity can never be a compelling state interest, but it found that the practices of Harvard and UNC, and really by implication, almost every college and university in the United States, it did not meet the test uh, to satisfy it, that the vague notion of a diverse student body, the vague notions of we're going to have a better campus because of this, or the vague notion that there might be greater dialogue on campus was not sufficiently narrow and clear so that while a diverse student body could be a uh, compelling state interest, it had to be clearly and concretely identified. In fact, we submitted on behalf of Legal Insurrection Foundation a, an amicus brief arguing that in Grutter, a, the compelling state interest was diversity of opinion. It wasn't diversity of skin color. It was diversity of opinion. And in fact, the history of the last 20 Something years- Something of which there is, is a, there is a great rarity. I mean, there's a scarcity gotten, of diversity of opinion in, in, in academia today. It's actually gotten worse. So that if that was the justification that no longer exists, they didn't cite us in, in their opinion. But so, and then the court also found that not only was it not clearly defined enough, that the remedy could never be stereotyping, and the remedy could never be a negative. It could never be to hurt somebody else as a remedy to achieve this. And they found that, in fact, and pointing to the Asian students here, in this zero-sum game, there were people who were getting hurt. And they included in the opinion a chart which was created by the plaintiffs uh, in the case and included in their brief. And I think copied and pasted into the opinion, I don't think anybody doubted the accuracy of it, showing the deciles for SAT scores and how, and I, I might be off on the number, but I, th I think, you know, Asian students had to receive, I think it was 140 more points on the SATs. Again, I might be off on the number, but some very large uh, amount higher than similarly situated black students and even white students, although not as big a gap. And then essentially, you know, if you look at the deciles that a black student in, I think it was the third or fourth from the bottom decile, um, had a 
same chance of getting into Harvard as an Asian student in the top decile. So an Asian student at the top of the statistical ladder had no better chance of getting in than a black student, black applicant, very low down on that ladder. And there were many ways you could slice and dice these statistics, but basically the court said that here you are using stereotypes, you are um, actually harming people, and you can never use, your compelling state interest can never be used as a negative to, to harm other people. And so the court found that the schemes that they had were violation of the 14th Amendment and unlawful. Yeah, I find it very interesting um, because, of course, uh, the argument for affirmative action is that African Americans are the descendants of slaves, or many of them are the descendants of slaves and therefore are historically discriminated against because of Jim Crow and everything that has happened in American history. But of course, African American applicants didn't have to prove that they were themselves you know, the descendants of slaves or had experienced discrimination. And of course, Asian Americans were themselves the subject of historical discrimination in, in, in this country, sometimes very terrible discrimination. Um, you know, a little known chapter of American history, but very true. Um, and doesn't this in some ways, I mean, illustrate the way critical race theory and intersectionality the, the sort of permanent race war that, you know, the, this idea, these ideas about uh, t white privilege work. Because, as you say, the expectation 25 years ago was that, this, you know, such schemes couldn't last forever. But these ideas uh, are based on the idea that we're in a permanent race war, that we could never achieve a colorblind blind society, and that even if we could, it wouldn't even be desirable. Yeah, and, and I think that that, stereotyping issue played very large in the court's opinion. And the court did not say that no one can, contrary to a lot of the propaganda, uh, that nobody could mention, you can't know the race of the person. So one thing that all parties conceded um, was that while you can't take the person's race into consideration, you can take their experience with racism. So if a black applicant could show that yes, I suffered from racism. I went to a school that was underfunded because of racism, or my parents, we grew up poor because of, my father lost his job because of his race, whatever, if they could prove that they actually- Or at had least to... assert it. I, it. It's not clear that any of that would, could be, you know, is gonna be proved in a college application essay. Right, but you could write an essay, and that's, you know, where we're heading, I think, after this case. You could write an essay saying that how you have overcome personally racism, you've encountered that. But what the schools can't do is stereotype people and say, just because you're black, we're gonna give you, uh, you know, some sort of remedial benefit here uh, for racism that took place dozens or hundreds of years ago. So it was that stereotyping that I think um, played a, a big factor in everything. I guess my next question um, is, can universities evade the court ruling, um, you know, because of, you know, in, in defense of racial quotas in some way? Um, certainly in the past, something that Heather McDonald has written about um, you know, when California passed a basically a you know a statewide referendum banning racial discrimination, you know, banning this kind of uh, racial quotas in in, in its schools, uh, universities found a way to get around it, or at least to some extent. Um, is that going to happen here? And does this, as logically it would seem to be, does this have any impact on the imposition of sort of the woke catechism of diversity, equity, and, inclu and inclusion, DEI, you know, in workplaces and even government decisions and hiring practices, um, since these, pra you know, DEI has been adopted throughout American society, and that would seem to, you know, the embrace of equity, which is the opposite, not, 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 not a synonym for, but, you know, really in some ways the opposite of equal opportunity, and which was very much, you know, highly featured, you know, in some of the, you know, the opinions here, um, you know, we, where does this go now? Yeah, well, in terms of evading, so the first part, uh, there's no question the schools are going to try 
they it was near universal i would dare say universal <laughs> condemnation from university administration stations um my you know i got the email within minutes of the decision from the uh, from harvard uh, and Harvard's very smug about it. They quote the line in the opinion about how you can take into account someone's experiences with racism through essays or other things. Um, and the next sentence from Harvard is, we're going to obey the court. A very smug sort of thing, saying they just ruled against us, but they left this little loophole. And so the way I, the primary way when it comes to applications, I think schools will try to evade this, is simply have an application question. Have you had an experience with racism or how has racism impacted your life? And they will point to that sentence in the Supreme Court decision, which says that that's okay. Of course, the next, literally the next sentence in the Supreme Court decision that Harvard didn't quote in its mass email, says you can't use the essays to ev evade the, uh, this decision uh, and that, you know, when it comes to enforcing the uh, civil rights laws and the 14th Amendment, we look to the substance, okay, not it just... Does the, do, you, do you anticipate, you know, follow-up cases, you know, in the future for this? Probably, but I think while this, you know, a lot of people say, oh, this was a big loss, I, I think Harvard probably views this in a strange sort of way as not a terrible result. They bought themselves nine years. They've been fighting this case for nine years. However many tens of millions of dollars they spent on legal defense, they don't care. It's a drop in the bucket. Their endowment's over 50 billion with a B. They couldn't care less. So yes, I think there will be litigations. And five to 10 years from now, we'll find out the result of those litigations. I think the only way, so the universities, and this is a broader topic, maybe for another show, are, are really arrogant uh, at almost every major university. They will fight you to the death in court with other people's money, with donor money and state money. Uh, they don't care, and I don't think Harvard cares, and I think Harvard's going to devote all its energies to evading this decision. And if they get sued, they get sued, they'll fight it. Uh, I think the only way we'll have relatively quick legal resolutions is if somebody is sloppy and doesn't do the little dance that we think they're going to do. But if they do the dance, they'll take the litigation risk. That's one thing universities have shown time and again, particularly in campus, you know, sexual harassment cases where, you know, they set up tribunals that are unfair to the accused. They'll fight those for years uh, and they just don't care. So this is, that said, this is a very important decision. And getting to your second part of your, your question with DEI, this is an absolute rebuke of DEI. This is an absolute rebuke of Ibram Kendi's anti-racism theory, which is predominant on campuses. The notion of equity- And now been, also adopted by the Biden administration and every Biden government department and agency. Has been rebuked as inconsistent with the 14th Amendment. So while this case only on its face applies to university admissions, the rebuke of the equity agenda, I think, will have a ripple effect throughout the legal system. And I think this case will be used in employment cases. This will be used in other campus cases. And this will be used to attack the DEI agenda, racial stereotyping on campus, uh, events that are segregated by race. Uh, you know, at Legal Insurrection, we have a project called the Equal Protection Project which is equalprotect.org, and we've challenged many campus programs where outright segregation of events, uh, programs open only to non-whites, -white, very common. Uh, and so what I think you'll see is a lot of schools will be more coy about it, more cautious about it. They'll try to achieve the same thing, but they won't be as open about it. So the DEI, this does implicate DEI. DEI has been rejected uh, six to three by the Supreme Court, the equity versus equality, equality under the 14th Amendment prevails legally, and that will, I think, affect a lot of areas of the law. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, that that just, you know, it, it, it should give hope to people who basically were giving up because it's sort of the woke catechism and, uh, you know, it's, which controls popular culture and, 
you know, the academia and now government as well and big business um, seem to be sort of, uh, you know, invincible, but uh, the court has uh, put a dent in that. Uh, now let's turn to the next big case that was resolved at the end of the term, the 303 creative case, as it was known, about the right of a conservative Christian designer to refuse to use her talents to um, create a gay marriage website. What happened there? And did, as uh, its critics claim, the courts really le legalize discrimination in this case? Well, this is a distinction that's been extremely important. There was a prior case that most people probably heard of, not this one, but the Colorado baker, okay? And the Colorado baker who would bake a cake for anybody, but he didn't want to have to put on the cake a message that he disagreed with on religious grounds. And so uh, that- And, and that made... was kind of an artisanal, you know, bakery, you know, sort of, you know, uh, not, not just like, you know, an over-the-counter cake, this was a matter of people being asked, you know, being asked to use their creative talents to celebrate something that, in, in this case, whether you agree with it or not, violated their religious uh, beliefs. That's right. And so this case involved a wedding website designer um, who uh, did not want to have to design websites for same-sex weddings. And uh, under... Colorado law, she was would be threatened with, you know, sanctions for that, just like the baker was. Colorado spent years going after the baker and, until they finally lost. Um, and so this person filed a declaratory relief action that uh, preemptively that she did not have to write messages or use her artistic skills to design something that she disagreed with on religious grounds. She never claimed that she couldn't um, design or wouldn't design a website for gay people, um, but she said, you can't force me to write a message, develop a message under the First Amendment that I don't agree with. You can't compel me to speak under the power of the state. And that's really the issue. So it's the distinction between who you can serve, you have to serve everybody, but do you also have to write a message that you disagree with? And that was the case. It was a First Amendment case, very similar to the Colorado Baker. I think it's very interesting. I think these were both in Colorado. And, uh, and the Supreme Court said that, no, that is an expressive message and that the state cannot force you to say that, something you disagree with. The other side says, well, that's legitimates discrimination. And, and it's not if you if you look at it in the sort of distinctions we often make in First Amendment cases uh, between speech versus versus conduct. So the, a, a store can't refuse to serve gay people. The question is, do the, does that store have to affirmatively state a message with which they disagree? Now, I understand, you know, people say, well, that's a distinction without a difference, but it's a big distinction when it comes to the First Amendment. Uh, just like you could not, uh, and they say, well, well, you know, we're not going to serve, you know, we're not going to write messages pro-Trump, and they're like, that's fine, you don't have to, okay? The state can't compel you to write, you know, MAGA on a cake, okay? Nor and, could it, nor should it be able to it, compel, but, say, a, a Jewish, a kosher bakery from doing a Nazi cake. You know, and, and so that that's it, you're right. Okay, it works both ways. Okay, uh, and 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 that's the First Amendment. Sometimes you have results you're maybe not thrilled with, um, but that's why we have you know free speech. So uh, and that's it. And, and the court cited a case that was long embraced by liberals. Um, you know the the case uh, I'm forgetting the name of it, where you know uh, Jehovah's Witnesses were uh, you know was, were being prosecuted because they wouldn't say the Pledge of Allegiance. And the court back in the 1940s this said this was a you know landmark liberal decision said you couldn't compel speech the government can't compel belief um and yet um contemporary liberals seem to want to compel belief i mean it's not as if we're debating gay marriage anymore but um the political left seems to want to eradicate you know from the public square um in any way anybody who might dissent from that that's right you know a lot of times if people refer to me as conservative. At least on these issues, I'm actually just an old school liberal. 
okay? But the decisions you're now calling conservative were actually were pretty standard for decades, liberal positions on free speech. Uh, and the Pledge of Allegiance is a, is a good one, and, and now it, it's this. So the, that's the tension that we have. And I think the reason we're seeing a lot more of these cases recently, the Colorado Baker and this one, is there is a tendency on the left in this country to want to make you uh, not just, you know, tolerate them, but you have to agree with them. They, it, there's that old Seinfeld episode about, you know, um, he, he didn't wear, want to wear the AIDS ribbon, okay, <laughs> and forcing him to wear the ribbon. You must wear the ribbon. Well, that's what we've come to in society is that they want to force you to wear the ribbon. They want to force you to say things you don't believe that are in agreement with them on using the power of the state. So these are, are really important cases that are going to have... It's a this. fundamentally illiberal position. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, there has been a controversy which is completely, really, I, I think, fabricated after the decision, uh, mm -hmm. which is that was this whole case fraudulent? That, you know, there was in the district court um, a filing about how this uh, wedding website designer had received a request after she filed the case from some person through the internet to design a website. And that, that got put in evidence. Nobody really paid attention to it because that wasn't the basis of the lawsuit. The basis of the lawsuit is the state of Colorado has said they will prosecute these cases. They've done it to the baker, and they won't tell, they won't promise me that they won't prosecute me. So she filed- Put, put, put you out of business and, and right. you know, so, find you and make your life miserable. So she filed a preemptive, which is allowed as a procedure, uh, you know, declaratory judgment that this law is not enforceable. And, and that's something you can do because you shouldn't, to contest the law, you shouldn't have to violate it and risk civil or criminal penalties. You can go to court and say this law, and this happens all the time, there's nothing unusual. Uh, and, and so now a lot of people say, well, this is a setup because the guy who supposedly submitted the request online is now denying that he did it. There was never a real request to design a website. But yeah, the New York Times did an article on it, but as even the Times specified, neither the majority nor the minority took this into account. So it's it, not it. going they had to be no an issue. Yeah. in the case, okay? Right. Uh, because everybody stipulated that she would be prosecuted by Colorado if she did this conduct, this action in refusing to do, design the website. So it was irrelevant, but this is what we're getting. It's part of the overall attack on the legitimacy of the court by the left because they don't like the decisions. They're trying to claim this was a fraudulent decision. And unfortunately, there are supposedly reputable people, reputable lawyers, um, reputable law professors who are going along with this. And it really just shows you how poisonous the atmos atmosphere has become. But this was a big First Amendment win. If it was anything other than advocating a, a message related to gay marriage, if it was the, the Pledge of Allegiance, if it was anything else, the left would be lined up behind this decision. But because they don't like the substance of this, you know, uh, refusal, they're against it. Yeah, I, I think that's very, very true. I, I want to digress for a moment from the court to ask you about the role that mainstream Jewish organizations played in these uh, two cases. How is it that the Anti-Defamation League, as well as the Reform Movement, among others, put themselves on the side favoring discrimination in, administra in admissions, such as Jews experienced a century ago, and against, in, in the case of the creative case, uh, against religious liberty, which a minority group, uh, such as the Jews, ought to be expected to support. Why were they on the side of the, you know, of, of the people you know, forcing discrimination and and trying to suppress uh, free speech. Yeah, it just shows, and I, I know we've talked about this before, how the ma many, many, not all, but many of the mainstream so-called Jewish organizations, organizations particularly like ADL that uh, grew up fighting anti-Semitism, have now sold themselves out to the progressive movement. And... ADL particularly is turning into the seventh, the equivalent of the Southern Poverty Law uh, Center. They're trying to get people kicked off the internet. 
They are a leading advocate of internet censorship. They um, regularly weigh in on issues that have nothing to do with what their supposed mission is, which is fighting anti-Semitism. And I know you're familiar with this, but one of my favorite examples is within hours of Brett Kavanaugh having been nominated to the Supreme Court, the ADL came out with a statement denouncing that nomination. Actually, I, I believe, and I think I wrote about it at the time, uh, you know, J Jonathan Greenblatt, their, their CEO, tweeted in opposition to him literally within minutes of the announcement. Oh, so I gave them I gave them the benefit of the doubt that it was hours. <laughs> he was okay. just sitting with his, his phone waiting to do it. Yeah. You know, why why is this? And and follow the money. They are the recipients of tens of millions of dollars. The last time I looked, ADL's uh, donations and budget were up over a hundred million dollars a year. Jonathan Greenblatt, I believe, is making north of a million dollars. This is corporate corporations are where the money is for these organizations. That explains the ADLs of the world. It doesn't explain necessarily mainstream, more religiously oriented, mostly reform, uh, you know, organizations that reform movement organizations that they, you know, put uh, progressive politics above everything else. You know, uh, you know, I've personally experienced this. We left, you know, the town we live in only has one temple and it's reform. And we left it 30 years ago because even that long ago, the politics were so poisonous and the rabbis were, they, they might as well just be on the payroll of the Democratic, you know, National Committee. That's how open it was. And that's a problem throughout that I think, and that's why you have a lot of disaffected people because, you know, they don't go to temple for the politics, but it's, in, you know, really infused with progressive politics. And so that explains a lot of the, the so-called Jewish organizations and why they jumped on this bandwagon. Uh, we could have a whole program on that. I know we have had a whole program on that. And, and there's a great- Worth mentioning again. And, you know, clearly, um, as I think we've both pointed out, a relig you know, politics now plays the role that religion used to play in the lives of most Americans. So it's it's hardly surprising that uh, Jews are behaving in this manner. Yeah, and, and it's unfortunate because you know ADL and other groups lined up against Asian students who were the subject of discrimination. In what world is that okay? Yeah, and and even to basically they were the beard of of Harvard, if I can use that term, uh, saying that oh no, it's nothing like the discrimination against Jews a hundred years ago. When of course it was exactly the same thing. Yeah, I mean Harvard had has mastered the holistic approach. I mean they developed it for use against the Jews. They maintained it for use against the Jews for decades, and now they found somebody else that they want to. Uh, take it out on, and that somebody else happens to be Asian students. You know, what people forget is that, you know, oh, they're so afraid that there'll be too high a percentage of Asian students. My response is, so what? Okay? Since when do we have to have America, at the university enrollment, look like America? Uh, how about the merits of each individual? Every one of those Asian students who was discriminated against has rights under our Constitution, and one of those rights is the right to equal protection of the laws. And it doesn't matter how they perform as a group. And you mentioned before, you know, critical race theory. If you read the dissents, particularly of Ketanji Brown Jackson, you could take the syllabus from any college or law school critical race theory course and read it, and that's her decision. It's, you know, systemic racism, it's lived okay. experience, which is just a such lived a bogus, experience, which is such a you know literary violation. I mean, it's a bogus expression, but it just you know, it just can't, you know. And so, you know, those those are the fault lines, the fault lines between the people who want to view people as members of groups, as proxies for groups, and look for group justice as opposed to individual justice. And our constitution has always protected individual rights. And that's something that they, the, a fundamental fault line that had this decision gone another way, had Ketanji Brown Jackson been in the majority on these decisions, not the minority on the decisions, American law would be critical race theory.
Yes. I think that's something people need to keep in mind. It's not just her. There are a lot of judges out there who would be all too happy to adopt a critical race theory approach and a group identity approach and look at disparities and outcomes as me as reflective of you know uh, discrimination in and of itself as they and have so, in so many other cases yes yeah and, and so I think that is the trend I I you know I don't know if 20 years from now depending how the judicial nominations go and, and the health of people uh, you know whether the court would reach the same decision if the replacement judges are ideologically the equivalent of Katanji Brown Jackson and you're going to infuse a group identity critical race uh, view of the Constitution. So I, I think people should take this as a warning sign that we're okay for now, at least at the Supreme Court level, but don't think that there isn't a movement, including among judges, to take a different approach to the law. Yeah, um, that's so true. Let, let's turn now to the last of the big three at the end of this last judicial term, the one striking down President Biden's really extra legal effort to uh, forgive student loan debt. The question that I'm asking myself about it is not why the court took a stand that was in line with the positions that Biden himself and former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi once took, saying that, you know, obviously the president doesn't have the power to do that by himself without, you know, the support of a congressional law. But how is it that this decision, which was on the law and not on the wisdom of the policy, whether or not it's a good idea to forgive student debt, was not unanimous. What does this say about our, you know, our courts right now um, that, you know, three, three judges were willing to say it's OK for Biden to make up to do anything he wants? Yeah, I mean, that's we should be heartened by the decision. The decision essentially was that a president does have the ability under a separate law to make modifications to some of these loan provisions, but this was not a modification. This was a complete rewrite. Uh, and he did not have the power to completely rewrite the law, uh, and so it was not within his power. Exactly what Nancy Pelosi said, and they quoted her in the decision. Okay, so, you know, I think everybody knows Joe Biden had no power to do this, but it's a, another one of those, you know, the the results justify the means that Democrats, for political reasons, want to forgive the student loans um, because they think it'll get them votes. And uh, if that means that Joe Biden violates the law, they're willing to go along with it, even though Nancy Pelosi had one of those rare moments of candor where she said, he can't do that. We all know he can't do that. Uh, and he did it anyway. And they don't care. And that's one thing we see time and again. They are willing to take the risk of litigation because there's no real consequence for them. So Joe Biden violated the law by pr proposing this or trying to enact it through executive action. Okay. Yeah. And it didn't work. Yeah. You no. Know? Not like he's going to jail. Not like he's getting fined. Okay. He essentially made a nice try almost got what he thought would be a political advantage, and it didn't work, and he'll do it again. And that's a lot of the problem with runaway executive power is that when they're stopped, for the most part, they're just stopped. There's no real penalty for them. There's no reason for them not to try it again. And I think that's probably the same for Harvard and for the schools in the discrimination cases. If they get caught in the next one, and if six years from now, the Supreme Court again says you shouldn't have done that, well, they tried and they got away with it for six years. So I take a somewhat cynical attitude towards a lot of these cases. Now, Biden reacted to these decisions by saying that this was, quote, not a normal court. And the Democrats' uh, young rock star influencer, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, said they were authoritarian and deserved to be impeached. Um, doesn't this, uh, the record show that actually the court's decisions were not partisan, and that, in fact, the two justices who, as I read the statistics, who voted in the minority the most in the last term were not, you know, members of the three liberals, but the two most conservative justices, uh, Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. Isn't this this line about, um, you know, a, a not normal court a kind of just, just politics? Well, they didn't make that sort of comment when things go their way. Uh, 
you know, the court decided a Voting Rights Act their way. All of a sudden, it's a great court, or at least for that moment, a great decision. So yeah, it's very cynical. Uh, Chuck Schumer, many others have been vitriolic in their criticisms of the Supreme Court because they're not getting the decisions they want. They're, what once the there was a 6-3 conservative majority, and it doesn't always split that way. That's no, clearly really not. I mean, in many cases, I'm, the conservatives, the, the li three liberals tend to be very, you know, stalwart, but, you know, some of the, you know, Justice Roberts is clearly, you know, the Chief Justice clearly cares about affirmative action. He was, you know, famously wrote that you can't solve religious discrimination, you know, but, but you know, but, you know, racial discrimination by more racial discrimination. But he's kind of wobbly on lots of other issues, as is Kavanaugh. Um, you know, so it's, it's you know, they, they, they kind of go with the flow. Um, not so the, you know, the, the three uh, liberals, uh, but yet that's the line that we get about uh, this court. Yeah, and when it was 5-4, it was always, you know, in most cases, John Roberts or Kennedy, the swing vote, uh, because the four were always united. Like, they never broke away on anything that's major societal importance, maybe more legalistic, technical issues they would break away. As, as the united. loan forgiveness issue shows, I mean, the, the liberal justices, they vote for politics and not, not so much always the, the conservatives. Yeah, and, and so it's really hard to to understand how they could think that this was something he had the power to do. And, but there's a, a hope. Ever since the left figured out, and it really was when Merrick Garland was not confirmed, he was never even given a hearing, and that seat remained vacant and then was filled by Neil Gorsuch when Trump took over. Uh, ever since they realized that they're not going to be in the majority anytime soon, they've decided they have to destroy the court by any means possible. And so there has been a concerted campaign to demonize the court, to paint it as illegitimate, to investigate the justices, to investigate their families, to do oppo research on ju justices of the Supreme Court, to try to intimidate them, to protest outside their homes over the abortion, to try to kill uh, Brett Kavanaugh, a lunatic inspired by the, the agitation coming from the mouths of Democrats. Uh, about abortion, know, yeah. About abortion, tried to kill, went to his house uh, with a gun with intent to kill uh, and was stopped at the street by the federal marshals who were protecting the home. Uh, isn't it interesting how that was memory hold so quickly? Had that been somebody going to the doorstep of Sonia Sotomayor or Kagan um, or any liberal justice, uh, we, we would have been talking about it every day for years now within a week. It was memory hold by the mainstream media. It's never spoken about. It's never talked about anymore. But that just goes to show you how vitriolic, you know, Chuck Schumer standing on the steps of the court saying, you will reap the whirlwind. Yes, uh, see, basically you, we're coming for you in a way we're that... For you, and it, they did. It, yes, and they yes. Did. Um, the, it got, that, that's really important. I mean, I, I think the left has, as you said, been at pains to smear the Supreme Court with you know, uh, ethical charges uh, as well as uh, ideological criticisms. How fair are those allegations once you break them down? And what does that say about our political system uh, that the court is under fire in this matter? Yeah, it's, it's you know, all out war by the left on the Supreme Court. I think that the leak of the early draft, which ended up looking a lot like the final draft, but it was an early draft. Of, of the, the Dobbs abortion decision uh, you know, last year. The abortion year. decision was unprecedented. Uh, and that we don't know who did it to this day is really astounding. I think that whole investigation was probably mishandled. But the, uh, so yeah, I mean, there is- Well, we an, could do a program, you know, sort of uh, pick your favorite conspiracy theory about that, but we'll leave that to, to some, some other podcast. But the fact that uh, we don't know, the fact that we don't know, I think is- pretty unbelievable, um, which shows that it probably was very well planned. Somebody covered their tracks really well. Yeah. Well, I've got my own conspiracy theory, but we'll, we'll, I'll save that for some other, uh, for some other time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. the what, contrast, yeah. Uh, uh, let me just switch gears for a moment and contrast what we've been talking about. You know, the, with the American left support of the Israeli left. And uh, their defense of an essentially lawless and all-powerful Supreme Court 
um, you know, it's obviously hypocritical because at the same time, there's they're, they're critics of an independent court in this country. Why do you think that the Biden administration and its supporters, especially in the press, see no contradiction between their support for Israel's court and their suggestion that, uh, you know, American Supreme are somehow illegitimate? Well, I think, again, it's just a, the end justifies the means. They, they don't like Netanyahu. They don't like the quote unquote right wing Israeli, you know, political groups. Uh, they uh, are much more sympathetic to Israeli leaders who th are just like they are from the progressive left. So I think that they don't really look at it and say, oh, well, you know, maybe you have a point here. We don't like a runaway Supreme Court either, and maybe some accountability is warranted, whether the particulars of that plan are good or bad. But, you know, clearly a, a Supreme Court that is impervious to even a normal, you know, advise and consent process like we have here uh, is not healthy for a democracy. Uh, so, but the, because they like the Israeli left, okay, they view yeah. Israel as intransigent. <clears throat> they want, you know, Israel to give up land for peace, even though giving up land has never resulted in peace. Uh, it's the, you know, State Department mentality from the 1950s brought brought forward that we see in so many ways. They they like the Israeli left politically, and they're willing to see Israel destroyed and paralyzed if to protect that Israeli left. Yeah, well, I, I think the, you know, I, I think the hypocrisy here is obvious, but it also, you know, it's also important to point out that there really is no comparison between the power exercised by the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, their ability to, you know, render judgments on anything regardless of whether there is a legal question that doesn't have to be justiciable, no one has to have standing, and they don't have to, you know, their decisions don't have to adhere to existing law, but just be based on whatever they think is reasonable compared to a very, and I would say, conservative, small C America, you know, American Supreme Court, which is l very limited in its, you know, um, willingness to strike down laws or presidential actions to just what is, you know, stated in the law. They, it's not just, you know, based on what they consider reasonable or their you know, deciding, well, you know, this is a bad policy, therefore I, I don't want it to go on. Um, indeed, Justice Roberts was so fearful of striking down Obamacare, um, you know, in spite of the fact that it was obviously unconstitutional, that he cre he basically rewrit the, rewrote that law himself in order to make it constitutional so that the court would not be overruling uh, the executive and the legislature. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, you hear... AOC and others talk about a repressive court, an ideological court. In fact, it's in many ways just the opposite. I mean, they refused to hear a challenge to Biden administration immigration policies because uh, I think it was Texas and maybe one or two other states did not have standing to sue, a very technical sort of a judicious refusal to get involved. So if the courts in the U.S. are reticent to get involved in political questions. In fact, they won't. They, in you know, political question doctrine, they're not going to rule on political questions. They rule on legal questions. Now, sometimes those legal questions have huge political implications, but they're not going to make, at least ostensibly, political decisions and get involved in politics. Uh, my understanding, and I claim to be an expert on the Israeli Supreme Court, is that that distinction is not really drawn there. No, not at all. <laughs> They basically have un they have arrogated to themselves basically unlimited power, as well as the ability to exercise a veto, an effective veto over their successors, which means that you know they perpetuate with you know the existing liberal majority goes on forever unless you know it is in some way limited by legislation. So yes, there is no comparison, but the comparison here is the hypocrisy of those who you know believe in an unlimited power for Israel's Supreme Court. And don't like it when the American Supreme Court, you know, ex exercises any power at all. Bill, thanks so much for joining us today. And anyone who wants to follow your writings should go to your Legal Insurrection website for more important insights. We also want to thank our audience. Please remember to tune in every day for Top Story Daily Edition, 
And whether you're listening to us on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, or any of the other co- podcast platforms, or watching us live on Facebook or Twitter, or on the JNS YouTube channel, please like and or subscribe to Top Story, click on the bell for notifications, and give us good reviews. Please write to us at editor at jns.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. Once again, we'll be taking next week off, but we'll be back the week after that. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself, and we'll see you again soon.